All right, everyone, welcome back. So in our last podcast, we talked about the history of psychology and where it is today. So we're going to spend a little more time in this video really focusing on what psychologists do today and how it is, what their work kind of looks like. So the, por the purpose of today is to describe all the different approaches or perspectives that a psychologist would use to study the human um, mind, the human behavior, the human thoughts, processes, anything that has to do with humans. So... Goals of psychology, no matter what kind of psychologist you are, it doesn't matter if you are a social psychologist, you're an industrial organizational, you're a human factors, you're a clinical, you're a researcher, doesn't matter, right? You all have the same goals. First goal, describe. Describe what is happening. What is the person doing, thinking, feeling, whatever, right? Explain. Why is it happening? What is causing the behavior, the thought the person is experiencing or the people, the group of people? Then you're going to predict. So you're going to figure out what would cause this to happen again in the future or not? And if it did happen again, what would it look like? And the last one is influence, or a lot of times you'll see it as control. It's the idea that how can we make it better in the future? How can we influence the human condition to improve it for people in the future and control things so that bad things don't happen so much anymore? So there's a couple different modern perspectives of psychology. There's psychoanalytic, behavioral, humanistic, cognitive, biological, sociocultural, evolutionary, okay? Now, here's the deal. You might be one of these. Like, if you're a psychologist, you might only study behavioral psychology, and that might be what you really care about. Most psychologists don't only study one. They study various ones, okay? But no matter what kind of psychologist you study, it's the why that's going to be different. So describing is going to look the same for you, okay? And the example I'm going to give you is watching someone get hurt and doing nothing. Okay, it's helping behavior. So if I see someone get mugged and I see a bunch of people standing around in a circle watching them get mugged and doing nothing, I would describe that the same way. I, you know, people were watching, someone else get hurt, saying certain things, acting as, I would describe it, right? But now why does this happen? That why is going to be different based on what school or perspective or approach of psychology I am. If I'm a cognitive psychologist, my explanation of why is going to be very different than if I'm a biological, sociocultural, evolutionary down the line. So it's the why that changes according to which psychologist you really are. So, first perspective is the cognitive perspective. This is what you just studied when you studied memory. Cognitive psychologists really focus on how our minds think, problem solve, and reason. And one of the big things they study is memory, right? How, do hu how does human memory and thoughts work? Important people are Piaget, not Piget, Piaget, and Ellis. And you will learn more about those people in the future, so don't have to stress about them so much right now. Okay. Some of the things that they might study, have you ever had something on the tip of your tongue? And we talked about this with memory, that, that moment where you know it's there, but you can't say it, and then all of a sudden the person walks away and it comes back. They would want to study, how does that happen? Okay. They also might study why memories make us laugh out of nowhere. So what is it that's going on in your brain and the thinking? Okay. When they look at human behavior, such as why people would not help when they see someone else get robbed, they would look at that the behavior is the result of what you think and how you think. So in that situation, what are the people who are watching someone get robbed thinking, and how does what they think impact the way that they act? All right, so if you look here, you have the cognitive perspective, right, how we process information, and then the explanation of helping behavior. So our individual interpretations affect how we respond. For example, maybe I think that the person getting mugged deserves it, or maybe I think if I'll get involved, then I might get mugged, or maybe I think that someone else is going to help, and so I don't know if I need to help because I'm waiting for someone else to do it first, right? So our interpretation, the way we think about the event, will impact how we respond. Next perspective is the biological perspective. There's no one really important you need to know, okay? And this perspective of psychology focuses on the brain and genetics. What they really pay attention to is in terms of human behavior, they want to know or they believe that your behavior is the result of a biological cause. That means that something in your genetics, maybe some chemicals in your brain, or some physical change in your body like pregnancy, puberty, uh, cancer, something, right? Something biological actually impacts your behavior, okay, and your thought process. They all really believe that it's uh, based in your brain and in your body and your nervous system, biological brain. 
So if you look here, right, the biological perspective focuses on structures that are in your brain that give you certain thoughts or emotions. So certain parts of your brain, certain chemicals of your brain. And they might explain why someone does or doesn't help when they see someone being mugged by the idea that certain emotion uh, could lead to helping behavior. For example, if you have don't have enough of one brain chemical, you might feel more sadness. And when you're sad, they actually know that you're less likely to help. So if you're depressed, you might not help someone because the chemicals in your brain make you depressed and that makes you more likely to or less likely to help. It also might have to do with a couple of other things things with your brain, right? So maybe uh, there's a different chemical in your brain that's causing you a lot of fear. Maybe you have a lot of anxiety and fear. And so that chemical stops you from helping because you're very worried where the person next to you might help because they don't have as much fear. Okay, it's all about the way that your brain works and how the chemicals in your brain control your behavior and your thoughts. Next perspective is the sociocultural perspective. And this perspective really focuses on uh, society and culture. So how it is? How is it that the culture you grew up in, the family you grew up in, the religion you grew up in? Did you grow up in the United States or China? Did you grow up in the North or the South of the United States? Did you grow up in North Dakota or in Florida? Right? How did the society and the culture around you impact the way that you behave? So the result, your behavior as a human being is the result of some sort of cultural ethic, ethical norm and a lot of times societal pressures that are put on you. So for an example, in our culture, getting married uh, is a certain, uh, you know, like pressure that, that, are put, that is put on young people, especially women. You know, you're supposed to be married by, oh, excuse me, oh, 30-ish or so, right? So an example of this might be that a 30-year-old woman in another culture might not feel bad at all about living at home with her parents. But in the United States, she feels a lot of pressure and she might be more likely to get into a marriage that maybe she isn't exactly happy about so she can be married. How does this affect the helping behavior, right? So our thinking and behavior change depending on the setting or the situation we're in. If we come from a culture that values helping, we might be more likely to help. Some cultures are called collectivist cultures, and they do what's good for the, for the whole. An example of this is in Asian cultures. They believe that what's best for the group is what's best for everyone. They're collectivists. In the United States, we're more individualist. What's best for me is what's best for me, and I should focus on myself before the whole. So if you come from a culture that's very collectivist, you might help. Whereas you come from a culture like America, it's very individualist, you might be like, eh, every man for himself, right? He's on his own, okay? Another example is that you're more likely to help if you're in a comfortable situation, if you're with a good friend. So maybe you know that person, maybe that person is your friend circle, you're more likely to help them than if they're not in your friend circle, okay? So it's all about the culture and the situation. Next is the behavioral perspective. Pavlov, Skinner, Bandura. You're going to hear those names again, but they're important people. They came up with this perspective. What they believe is that your behavior is based on your environment. What's happened to you in the past dictates how you will act in the future. Your behavior is the result of learning from experiences. You did something and you got rewarded, you do it again. You did something, you got punished, hopefully you won't do it again. And that nothing, everything about you is something that you learn to do based on if you got a reward or a punishment after you did it. Okay, this is kind of like phobias. People aren't born with phobias. They have they get a phobia like this arachnophobia because something awful happens to them and they learn to be afraid of the spider. How does this apply to helping? Well, the behavioral perspective thinks that humans work on rewards, punishments, and watching others. So monkey see, monkey do, right? I see someone else do it and I watch what happens to them and if they get a good response, I do it too. So if I have been in an accident or if I've been in a place before where I've seen someone help someone and get rewarded, then I might be more likely to help. Or if in the past I've helped somebody and been rewarded. But what if the last time I tried to help someone, I got punched in the face when I got in the middle of a fight? guess what? I'm not going to help again because the last time I tried to help, I got punished. So whether or not you help right now if someone's in danger will be based on how, how the last time you helped and what happened. Okay, next perspective, humanistic perspective. This perspective is really like the cuddly, lovey-dovey, like XOXO, hearts and kisses, okay? They focus on human potential and how all of us have this desire in, deep within us to reach our full potential in life and become all you can be, like the army, be all you can be. And the problem is, is that a lot of people don't get there because they don't have these needs that they need, uh, like to feel safe, to feel loved, to feel accepted. They're missing those things in their life. They don't have... Ex relationships that mean something or they don't have goals that are pushing them and humanistic perspective really focuses on how not having those things impacts your life and that any problems you have comes from the fact that you don't have any meaningful goals or relationships in your life okay so they focus on how healthy people strive to read our full potential 
well, how maybe the helping behavior. How would you explain this? So if, I'm, if I feel safe and comfortable, if I've gotten to eat that day, if I feel safe, then maybe I'm going to help, help out and like reach out and help this person. But if I haven't had any breakfast that day, you really think I'm going to, or lunch or dinner, if I don't have any food, do you think that I'm going to take as much time to stop? Maybe not. Like I'm so worried about getting food that I might not even think about helping this person. Or if I don't feel safe, right? If we're in a bad neighborhood and I'm worried that if I stop that something could happen to me, I might not get involved, right? So, you know, what I'm willing to do is based on what needs of mine are currently being met and if certain needs aren't met, I can't be in a place where I'm willing to help someone else. All right, and last but not least, this perspective is one of the oldest in psychology, and it's also something that a lot of people have a hard time with because it focuses a lot on your unconscious mind, your in ego, super ego, and this idea that you have a lot of like sex and anger and selfish, irrational, violent needs that are hidden underneath the surface in your unconscious mind. Your unconscious mind is like this iceberg, it's underwater. People can't see it. You don't even know it's there, but it controls you. And it's full of unacceptable sexual desires, fears, violence, immoral wishes, selfish needs, right? It's like the devil inside of you and it's controlling you, okay? And they really view that your behavior as a human is the result of some hidden desires in that unconscious or some conflict in that unconscious or a trauma that you don't even know about, but it controls you. It would be like if there was like a secret like kind of alien inside your brain kind of controlling you and manipulating you without you even really realizing it. All right, so and, and the new person, it's called psychodynamic now, but when it first came about by Sigmund Freud, it's called psychoanalytic, okay? So psychodynamic, how are we affected by our unconscious drives and conflicts? So maybe, for example, this person reminds us of our father who's getting mugged and we don't hate our father. We have a conflict with our father. Freud says that all people have issues with their parents. So maybe we have an issue with my dad and so I don't want to help him. Or maybe, um, you know, I feel like some sort of inner conflict as to whether I can actually help someone else. It's kind of hard to do this perspective. It's very, uh, something that people can easily attach to. But it would be like if you have some sort of trauma or issue in your past that comes up and uh, dictates how you act in the future. So for an example, if as a child I, you know, uh, have some sort of trauma from uh, my childhood, then maybe as an adult that trauma will come up and impact the way that I act as an adult. So here's the timeline. You can kind of see when each came about. As you see, structuralism and functionalism, those are from the last video. They were old school. Then psychoanalysis came along. Then behaviorism then sociocultural, then humanistic, then cognitive, and biological's kind of been there all along, right? But since we've gotten more and more um, technological and we've gotten more advances, the biological psychology has really been able to do more and, and give more back to the psychology knowledge because we have all these cool machines and things that we can do now that maybe we couldn't do before. So the last perspective that I wanted to go over, this is kind of the, one of the newer perspectives in terms of things that are popular in psychology, and it's based on a very old idea, right? Evolution, Charles Darwin, okay? The idea here is that all humans want to survive, that our motive for every single behavior we have is the result, we, we behave in certain ways in order to survive and reproduce. All of our actions are built on the idea that can I, can I survive and can I reproduce, okay? And we're going to do a little survey with this in class, and I think it'll give you a better idea but the goal here is that all human behavior is driven by survival. So I would help that person because I thought maybe if I helped them, then they would survive and then maybe I thought they were attractive and we would mate or something. Or maybe that person's my husband or wife and so I'm more likely to help them because if they die, I have less chance for reproduction. If that's my kid, I'm going to help them try to survive. But if it's a random person and getting involved is going to hurt me, I'm definitely not going to get involved and help them because I care about my own survival. Right? If the person is attractive, I might try to save them, like I said, because maybe then I could have a chance to reproduce with them. So it's all about reproducing and survival. So which perspective is right? All of them are right. You need a little bit of everything in order to get the full picture. So humans don't just help because of chemicals in their brain. And humans don't just help because of their culture. And they don't just help because of um, the needs that they have met and if they feel safe. There's a lot of humans help for a variety of reasons. It has to do with the chemicals in your brain and the way that you think and the rewards you've gotten in the past and if you have all your needs met. So it's an example of if you just look at the elephant and you're just holding the ear, you'd say, oh, it's a fan. Or if you were just touching the horn or the, the speed, 
spear. You you know, you oh, it's the tusk. You might say, oh, it's a, it's a knife, it's a spear. Or if you're just touching the nose, you might say, oh, it's a hose, right? But when you look at all of the elephant as a whole, you see it's an elephant. So you can't really break it apart. Every perspective has something to add to psychology, and most psychologists use more than one perspective. Some of them like one more than the other. So obviously, if you like to study the brain, you're going to be more biological. But you could study the brain and be biological and cognitive. You could study the way the chemicals work and the way chemicals make you think. Right? If you really like to study uh, relationships between people, you might be more sociocultural. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't also be sociocultural and behavioral and look at the way that people work together and how rewards and punishments helps group behavior or hurts group behavior. So you can combine them together in one. So that's all for now, AP Psychos. And remember, psychology is flipping awesome.